there was right there in front of me, and, I'm, and he, he's all looking all over the hill, and I was right down there at his feet, and my cousin, Jimmy Hendricks, jumped in and, and uh, pulled me out. Um, good evening. <laughs> um, without the ability to breathe, we can't live. Oxygen is a power source for our bodies in the same way our study today will look at prayer as a power source for the Christian life. The Apostle Paul describes his prayer for the people in Ephesus and asks God specifically to empower the believers to live a Christian life. I'm going to read verses, uh, chapter 1, Ephesians, verses 15 through 23. <clears throat> for this reason, I too having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints. Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him also, or the, uh, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We're going to try to watch this again. for spiritual sight because without spiritual sight nothing he's going to explain uh, even if he explains it as clearly as possible it, none is going to make any sense or it's going to make any difference sight is really really important and it, it's not something you would ever choose to be without that's that's why lighthouses are important because there's certain things you need to be able to see the theologian jonathan edwards said the spiritual sight is the greatest gift in all the world that god can give to you it's like it's like understanding something with your mind he, he said like like the honey is sweet um, but, but never having tasted anything sweet in your life and then suddenly having that sweetness of honey burst alive on your tongue as you tasted it for the first time. And you may have understood the concept of sweet before, but, but suddenly it becomes real, it becomes felt. When God gives spiritual sight, he takes the, the doctrines of the gospel that we understand with our minds and he makes them burst alive with sweetness in our hearts so that we, we, we do more than understand them, we feel them. Paul said there's so much more to Christianity. It's when you come alive with this love for God and this relationship with God. Now, let me ask you, do, do you often feel dry spiritually? Do you feel cold in your heart? That like something is missing? Do you feel like there ought to be more um, in your relationship with God? Well, Paul's answer is there is. There's much more. And this is what it goes back to. You need for what you know here in your head to come alive here in your heart. That's what this prayer is about. It's a prayer for spiritual sight. And this is most often what I pray for my family. It's what I pray for my church. And what I pray for myself. I mean, the Apostle Paul gives this prayer to us at the beginning of the letter of the Ephesians as a model prayer for how, how we can and should pray for others. There's four specific things that Paul is praying that we can see. And number one is, is hope. He says, I, I pray that you see the hope to which God has called you. In English, the word hope often implies something that we want to happen that we're, we're not exactly sure is going to happen. I, I sure hope, for example, that the Carolina Panthers win the Super Bowl next year and that they won't choke again and break my heart like they always do. Now, biblical hope is not something, however, that you're, you're unsure about. It's something you're, you're very sure about that simply hasn't happened yet, that you, you look forward to, um, that is going to reshape your entire outlook on life. And what is Paul saying that we are certain is going to happen? What is our hope? It's that we're going to be face-to-face -face with God, being filled with him, and, and we're going to be like him. 
And this hope reshapes how we see everything in life. It shows us what, what God, for example, is doing in our pain, how he is weaving that glorious tapestry we talked about in, in session one. Um, here's the second thing Paul is, is praying that we can see. He, he wants us to see our worth to God. Um, he says, I want you to see what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Honestly, people read right over that phrase sometimes because it, it just sounds like religious mumbo jumbo, the, the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints. But let's take a closer look because it really is an awesome thought. But first of all, whose inheritance is this? It's not ours, not yours. His glorious inheritance. God has an inheritance coming to him. You're like, why? Well, how could God have an inheritance? He does. Well, what does God not already have? His glorious inheritance in the saints. What is the one thing that God doesn't have yet that he really wants? Now, you ever hear that question, what kind of gift do you get a rich person who has enough money that they can buy whatever they want? Well, what do you give to a God who can literally speak anything into existence? What is the one thing that Jesus obtained on, on this side of the cross that he didn't already have on the other side? The answer is you and me. A rebellious traitor race that God desperately loves. We are what he wants. We are his inheritance that he's, that he's looking forward to receiving. Paul says, when you see how precious you are to God, that's going to totally transform your life. And later in, in, in this letter, in, in chapter 3, around verse 18, Paul is going to pray a second time. And this time he's going to say, I pray that you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, Paul is not one prone to exaggeration. He, he doesn't always speak in a lot of flowing, sentimental language. Usually he's like, you know, this is what God says, and I'm an apostle, so you shut up. But here Paul does something pretty unusual for him. He, 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 it's like he loses his words. The love of Christ surpasses all knowledge and, and my ability even to describe it. And he starts rhapsodizing about, about length and height and breadth and, and depth in God's love. How, how long is God's love for us? Paul tells us in Ephesians that it's from all eternity and for all eternity. God shows us in him, he says, before the foundation of the world, which means there's never been a time when God didn't know about us and love us, and there will never be a time in the future where, where he's going to quit loving us. His love was not conditioned on anything that we've done. Psalm 103 tells us that as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how intense, that's the height of God's love for us. If you want to measure the intensity of God's love for you, you got to get out your telescope. And that feeling you have when you just look out into the stars and you think about how big it is, that's the measure, the intensity of God's love for you. How wide is God's love? It literally controls every molecule of the universe, marshalling everything in pursuit of God's good purpose in our lives. There's literally not one stray atom in all the galaxies. The control of his love is that broad, that wide for us. How deep is God's love for us? It's so deep that he reached all the way down into the filth of of sin and the grave of death to make a wretch his treasure, literally becoming sin and death for us, dying in our place so that we didn't have to. That's how deep his love is for us. Paul says this love that surpasses our ability um, to comprehend it, much less describe it. Um, even as an inspired apostle, I can't describe it. I want you to, to know in your heart that love. I want you to, to taste it and to feel it, this love that, that, that passes all knowledge here. I want you to know it here in your heart. Here's the third thing Paul is praying that we, we would see, and that is the power um, that God is, is working inside us. He says um, in verse 20, according to the power of the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. God wants us to know the power that he is working in and around us in pursuit of his purposes for us. That power is measured, Paul says, by, by the resurrection. And honestly, if I were trying to tell somebody about God's great power, I probably would have picked creation. I mean, think about creating everything out of nothing. Seems like you, you couldn't get more powerful than that to, to speak a word and have 3,000 billion trillion stars burst into existence, each one putting out the same energy as a, a trillion megaton atom bombs, uh, which, by the way, is enough to meet all U.S. energy needs for a thousand years, every single second. And that's a lot of power. But Paul says that there's an even greater power than that at work in us right now, and that's the power of, of resurrection. Creation may be bringing life out of nothing, but the resurrection is bringing life back from death. It's easier to give birth to babies, they say, than it is to raise the dead. By invoking the power of the resurrection, Paul is saying that God not only has the ability to make us into something, to make somebodies out of nobodies, he has the power to turn bad things in our lives into good things. And that's good news, because for many of us, our lives have been marked by, by mistakes and death, addictions, destructive behaviors, broken relationships. Well, see, if God brought life out of death, 
with Jesus, then he can bring life and healing back to the mess that you've made out of, of your heart and your life. Do you realize the power that is available to you? Well, what if you really believe? Think about this. What if you really believe that God really would extend the power of the resurrection into your heart, into your marriage, into your relationships? That's what Paul is praying that we, we would see. Last and number four, he, he wants us to see the finality of Jesus' rule. Verse 22, Paul says, I, I pray that you would see that he has put all things under Jesus' feet, and that he's given him and his head over all things to the church. In other words, I pray that you'll see that the battle is already won and that Jesus is already securely on the throne. When the show 24 came out, I, I didn't watch it live. I did one of those Netflix bins watching deals one weekend. And, and there were times where things would look really, really bad for Jack, for Jack Bauer. And I think, you know, there's no way that Bauer is going to get out of this situation alive. But then I remember that there was a season number four. Um, and I would say, well, Jack Bauer's uh, you know, face is on the cover of season chapter four. And I think, well... I'm not really sure how he's going to get out of this situation, but I know he has to because his face is on the highlight reel of the next season. Paul says, I've seen the resurrection. I've seen Jesus' face on the throne when this is all over. And so I know that he wins. Um, now I just get to sit back and watch how this is all going to, going to unfold. Uh, furthermore, notice in, in this verse that Paul wants them to see that, that the main thing Jesus is doing in the world is, is building his church. That's what Jesus' primary focus is. We'll get more into this in, in later sessions, but the church is the, is the focal point of everything that God is doing in the world. For Paul, the, the church was not just an event that you attended on the weekend. It was a, a community, a family of faith that you, you built your life around because it was the place where God was and the place from where God's power flowed. And God is ready to move heaven and earth, Paul says, literally to pour out the power of the resurrection in order to complete the mission of, of, of the church in the world. You know, listen, there, there are 6,400 unreached people groups in the world who have little to no access to the gospel. What Paul is telling us is, is that it's not that there's a shortage of God's love or power to save them. It's not that Jesus is not, 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 not willing enough or powerful enough to save them. God is only waiting on somebody who will believe what, what he says he wants to do and, and then ask him to do it. Do you realize the power God has placed at our fingertips? Paul's prayer here, I am, am praying for you also during the study that you would see the hope that God has given you in the gospel, that you would see that he's in control, that he's working in all things, that you would understand your great work to God, that you would recognize the power God has put inside of you, and that you would ask God to extend that power through you to people all over the world who have yet to hear about it. Amen? Amen. They brought up a lot of good things, and we're going to highlight some of them. And we really need a, a discussion on some of this stuff, rather than just listening to me talk. Um, what stands out to you as you think about through what uh, Greer had to say? Any stories that grabbed you? Anything that he said that really just kind of struck a nerve? One of the things that got me was spiritual sight and we'll probably get into that a little bit later but it talked about it goes from the from the mind to the heart we can have head knowledge of god and until it until we internalize it and get it so that it's like uh i think um tom said here a week or two ago that aha moment when you read something You've read it a hundred times before, two hundred times before, and you're reading it, and all of a sudden it's like it's underlined for you, and you go, oh, wait, that's what that means. I finally understand that. That's when it goes from your head to your heart. Is anything like that? And I know that's happened to all of us, but that's one of the things that he mentioned in there was spiritual sight. Is there anything else that he... Uh, uh, he, now, he did mention four things. Do you remember what those four things were? Hope, work, power. Pardon? Hope and... Hope, faith, power, and finality. Yeah. Um, worth. Uh, our own worth to it. Ricky's cheated. He took notes while I was... <laughs> <laughs> I was reading the script. Oh. <laughs> that you read. We'll dig through the text and unravel each of these points. But first, 
We're going to look at verses 15 and 16, um, which says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Um, there's almost a, a storyline here um, when he talks about it. One of the things he talks about, he says, I've heard about what you're doing. I, I, I've heard that you came to faith in Jesus. You've accepted him as Lord and Savior. Um, you showed that love to all the people, not just to the people in church, but to everybody that you come in contact with. Paul heard about this. And as he prays, he gives thanks for what they've accomplished, for what, what has happened to them. And he remembers them in his prayers, and he doesn't stop doing that. He doesn't stop giving thanks. He doesn't stop giving, or stop remembering them in his prayers. If you look through, I have, um, I'm going to stop and think just a minute. Um, I have roughly 30 people that I pray for every night, sometimes during the day, but at least once a week, once a day, these 28 to 30 people, I count off my head to 14 and I wasn't even halfway through, so I have 28 to 40 people, or 28 to 30 people that I pray for specifically every day. Some of these people I see on occasion, some of these people I see quite often, some of them I've only seen, but well, one of them I haven't seen since I think Jimmy's funeral. But I know that he, even though I don't know him personally, I mean, I, I know who he is, I know about him a little bit, but I know that he needs a right relationship with God. And it's almost like now, it would be almost like um, I hear that he, he finally got right with God, he finally got saved. That doesn't mean I quit praying for him. That just means I pray for him more. But I'm praying for him now so that he will come to find Jesus. Um, oh, I can't think of the guy's name now. Um, maybe I'll come to it. Maybe you'll thank me a little bit later. How does viewing Paul's prayer as a story, you know, I see these people, uh, I hear, about, actually some of them he hadn't even seen. He heard about them. How does that affect us, or how should that affect us? You know, the, the big word that comes to me in those first two those scriptures you read is encouragement. Mm -hmm. Paul was so encouraging of, of the, his brothers and sisters that he met, and, and that's what to me just cries out in what he's teaching right. there. It's just like, I can't be there. But man, this is what you need to do, and this is, and I'm praying for you. You just keep fighting the good fight. You keep doing what you need to be doing, and you do all of that, and you'll be all right. And I'm right here with you, not physically, but I'm right here with you spiritually. Here's some possible insights that we can gain from that. Genuine faith is normally followed by an outpouring of love. Now, Hollywood. Well, I take it back. Satan takes good things of God, perverts them to the point where they look nothing like what God had originally intended. Um, if you would go up, I was gonna say on the square, but it's too cold for everybody to be up there now. If you go to a restaurant, any restaurant on any day when that's fairly full, and you would take a take a survey and ask them, what is love? What do you think that most people would come up with? Here in town, your own, your own friends, family, people that you know at work, of course, most of us are retired, most of us. Mm -hmm. But what do you think we would come up with as, as a definition of love? They'd probably say, I, I love my wife or I love my husband, but they wouldn't have a definition of it for you. Yeah, that's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to define, it really is. 
Um, do you think that out of all those people you talked to, that the word God would ever come up? Yeah. Doubtful. You know, it's possible. <laughs> Be my luck, I'd run into three preachers. Uh, you know, if I was calling, you know, if I was doing this, looking for a particular answer, and then I'd get something completely different. I, I would say that most of them know they, they probably, the love of God, because the word love has become so perverted and so perverse. Well, not love has it, but they, they have, the, the connotation of it is now, it, it's all physical, uh, base. Uh, the word love really doesn't have anything to do with God anymore. Um, Paul was paying attention to the spiritual development of the people he cared about. Do we fail the spiritual development of new believers? I, I think that sometimes we do. I, I think that <laughs> it's a person comes to faith in Jesus. Jesus has forgiven their sins, whether they go to an altar on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night, or we're talking to them at McDonald's over coffee, and they I just asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life. That's good, brother. We'll see you next week. You know, same time, same place. It seems like we don't, and not just me, I think all of us, all denominations, lack the discipleship aspect of putting arms around them and taking them a step at a step at a step at a time so that they can come to know this book and Jesus more intimately because quite frankly if somebody if all of a sudden they've lived their life going this way now all of a sudden they're going this way they have no clue what to do they really don't they have and just like with Paul these people well you look at Paul it says when he uh, had his Damascus Road experience he had been going this way now all of a sudden he was going this way and he had no idea what he was doing it says that he went to Arabia and studied for three years, pretty much by himself, searched the scriptures to find out just exactly what is this that I'm dealing with now. I know that I saw Jesus. I know that he told me that I needed to do this, but I have to equip myself. Now, Paul was smart enough in the, in the scriptures because of his background that he knew where to look. And well, their scriptures would have been the Old Testament. His scriptures would have been in the Old Testament, and he searched that diligently to find his own uh, signpost, his own uh, markers uh, to lead him into the life that he needed. But if you take somebody that has never had any religious experience at all, uh, no church going, nothing like that, what are they to do? How are they supposed to know where to even go look for the answers? And that's where we come in as, as uh, spiritual development. Though Paul had contributed to their spiritual growth, his response was not one of pride or boasting, but thanks to God. In other words, he's let, like us. We take these people from discipleship, you know, from a, a new a newborn creature in Christ into now they're a fully mature, and we can look back and say, oh, look what I did. Well, I helped him, you know, or I helped her. Look what, you know. But we've got to stay away from that. We have to do like Paul. We have to admit humbly, I may have helped a little bit, but it's God that did all of this. He apparently had a regular habit of prayer. Um, I have a habit of prayer. I try not to, uh, to break it. Um, and it's more than just once a, once a day or, you know, um, I, I know just before I go to bed, um, I'll kneel down at my bedside and I'll mention these 30 to 40 people that's on my prayer list, plus other things that come up ever, ever so often um, that need prayer. Um, and then during the morning, you know, uh, as I'm sitting there eating breakfast or drinking coffee and just sitting there and sometimes just asking God for guidance for, throughout the day, lead me to somebody that I can, can help, that I can be a blessing to. But I think sometimes I know that I will not only just pray for these particular people, but I pray for me. What was that? Um, Mom had a thing on her desk um, or on her 
uh, closet door. And uh, I took a picture of it. I probably got it on my phone somewhere. But it was, Lord, so far today, I haven't uh, upset anybody. I haven't got mad at anybody. Uh, I haven't uh, done anything wrong. Um, but you know, here in a couple of minutes, I'm going to have to get out of bed <laughs> and start my day. You know, uh, so, you know, it's like a lot of times we, we start off with good intentions and then we get out of bed and stub our toe or whatever or trip over the dog or, or whatever. And it just kind of ruins the whole day. I think Paul had some of those days too. I really do. This prayer is not just one and done. It's a continuing involvement. In verse 17, he says, uh, now he's talking about you. I, I make mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. I will go on uh, record tonight, and since it'll probably be out, since it's already being shown right now, I pray for our pastor every day, and I pray that God gives him wisdom, a discerning spirit, gives him strength, gives him the ability to obtain more knowledge from, from God. I want him to be the smartest man in the room when it comes to spiritual things because he's our spiritual leader. I pray that God would just grant him all these things so that when he sees a situation, he'll see it as God sees it, not as man sees it. Uh, and that's what Paul was doing here. He prayed that they would give, they would receive a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation. Um, that should be, this should be the goal of every Christian to know God, not to know about him, but to know God better every single day. If we're the same, uh, I can't remember which it was now, the Corinthians, I think it was, Paul told him, he says, look, you've been, uh, you started off with this uh, milk, uh, spiritual milk that, that you were fed. You've been doing that for a year now. Don't you think you ought to get on to some solid food? Don't you think you ought to dig in here just a little bit deeper? And he was getting after him because of that. And I think that a lot of people, <laughs> we had people at the credit union that says, uh, I have uh, been on the board for 14 years. Well, are you any smarter now than you were when you got on the board? Or have you done the same thing for 14 years in a row? And unfortunately, I've run into a lot of them that they had the same thing for 14 years in a row. They really wasn't any more knowledgeable now than they was back when they started, but they've still been on there for 14 years. When we know God, we should know more about him personally in our own personal life than we did last week, than we did last month, last year, five years ago. If we're not getting closer, it seems like God keeps moving. And if we're slow enough, all of a sudden he's going to be out of sight. You know, if you can't keep up, you're going to lose. And it's almost like that, almost like that with our spiritual life. We have to keep up with, with what God is showing us to do. If we stop and he keeps going, we're lost. You know, we have to end up and stay as close to him as we mentally and spiritually know how to do. Now, if all of a sudden he's moving along and I'm lagging, but it's because I'm asking a genuine question, I don't understand this. He's going to stop and come back and say, this is what I mean. You know, if we truly seek him, he's going to give us the answers. Um, who has um, Exodus 6, 7, chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 and 10. Okay. okay. Would you read that, please? Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And 8, 10? Yes. Then he said tomorrow, so he said, may it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. 
There's no one. You will know this. And in Psalms it says, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. In other words, what's that one? Be still and know that I am God. It says, cease striving. Stop spinning your wheels and just stop and think. I know who God is. And if I don't know him, then it's up to me to ask him to reveal himself. That's kind of scary because if we ask him to reveal our, himself in our lives, <laughs> he'll do it. And sometimes he'll, what was it the preacher said the other day that, uh, I think it was a pastor, that when you ask God into your heart, he's uh, not going to just sit in the living room and say, well, you know, what, what have you got? You know, and, and he's going to look in the drawers and he's going to look open the closet door. And, and if you're uncomfortable with that, <coughs> That's too bad because God wants to be in every part of your life. I've heard people say that, yeah, I want God to come into my life, but this over here, this is mine. This is just mine over here. I don't want anybody to mess with that. Uh, but when we ask Jesus into our hearts, he wants all of it. Um, John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's what he wants. He wants us to know the one true God. By knowing God, we can, we can work through anything. Um, is there a difference between knowing somebody and knowing things about them and really knowing them? I, I tell you this one guy that I'm, I'm praying for. Um, I know he was a friend of Jimmy's. Um, I don't think he's turned his lifestyle around like Jimmy did. Um, I know a little bit about him, but I don't know him. Can you think of examples of people that you know something about, but you don't really know them? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of people. We know kind of who they are, uh, but we really don't know them. And I think that anybody, if we're trying to lead someone to Christ, we have to know just a little bit more than just about them. We really need to know them. Um, we talk about Sunday school class hypocrisy. They may be putting on airs. They may be putting on a show that we really don't know that person until we really get, and the same way with God. We really can't know what he wants us to do until we truly know who he is. Um, do you think we can know God completely all at once, or is it a process? Process. Everybody thinks it's a process? Yes. <clears throat> well, I don't have any anything to refute you, so I guess I have to go along with it. Well, I think we'd be overwhelmed if we thought we knew everything. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. We talk about uh, blowing our minds, you know, and people, they go, Phew. yeah, I think that would yeah. happen physically to us. It would just, it would just upset us so. When it talks in, um, is it Ephesians 1.18? Um, we're not going to get that right now. Um, oh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, it talks about, um, we see in a mirror darkly, you know, um, and what it's talking about is we can see a little bit of what's going on. But because we're finite, because we're physical, and God is spiritual, God is spirit, we can't see everything as clear as we would like. But like Ricky says, if all of a sudden it was crystal clear, we might not be able to handle it at all. Um, we don't and can't understand yet. We can look in this mirror we can see images, we can see a little bit, but we're not going to see everything yet. But we will someday. We can step across that threshold into another world and it's only going to be... I get thinking about that every once in a while, especially since mom passed away. I wonder what that's like to just close your eyes here 
and you're in heaven. And it just, I mean, it's just so awe-inspiring, so overwhelming that I don't think our minds can take it. You know, I, I really don't. I know Paul uh, said that he was taken up into the third heaven. Uh, the third heaven in, in Jewish culture was, the first heaven was our air that we breathe. Uh, the second heaven was basically outer space, the moon, the stars. The third heaven was where God dwelt. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, and he said this person was caught up into heaven, whether in the body or out, I don't know. He actually didn't even say that he knew who it was, but all intents and purposes, it was Paul. Uh, and he says he heard things that you can't utter. I mean, it's, it's like uh, uh, one of the angels, they asked the angel, what's your name? He goes, it wouldn't make any difference. I told you, you couldn't understand it anyway. Uh, but he said he heard things and saw things that he could not describe in, in words. It's just, it was just too overwhelming, too awesome, too, I, I don't even, well, like I said, he didn't even have the words to describe what it was like. Um, I often think sometimes it would be nice. There was a song, uh, Third Day, I think, um, a, a caught a glimpse of your glory, you know, there's just a, like, a, like a lightning flash. You saw just a little bit of glory. I sometimes wish I could see that, just just a touch. Like um, song, show me your glory. Yeah, show me your glory. Um, I, I think I still got a cassette of that somewhere. But anyhow, that would be so nice to just, just catch a glimpse of what God is like. Um, I don't think anybody could be able to stay the same if they were. Uh, we, we get into four things that, that, that uh, J.D. mentioned. Paul is not only praying for believers would know God better, he wants us to know certain things about God and our relationship with him. And, it says, and he talked about hope. How would you define hope? Now, uh, Ricky and, and uh, Mark can't answer because we have this uh, uh, seminar yesterday that we went to, and the guy defined hope for us. So what, what do you, what, when you say the word hope, what do you think of? What was the definition of hope? Expecting something with confidence. She was at the seminar. <laughs> we didn't see her, but she must have been there. He says it's a desire accompanied by an expectation of fulfillment. Like he was saying, um, you can hope, you can hope the Bears are going to win the Super Bowl this year, but after their play today, I think that their expectation of fulfillment has long since left. Before today. For this year, yeah, before today, yeah. Uh, yeah, today was, second half, first half was pretty decent, second half not so much. Um, I still have a hope that Dallas is going to win the Super Bowl. And that can be a, accompanied by an expectation of fulfillment. They've still got a good shot at it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't really agree with that. If you're hoping for something, that's not necessarily, you don't really expect it. You hope it happens, but well, yeah, but a if, lot of things Well, you can hope that, that, I think what they're saying is, I can hope for something, but I know that it's so far out in left field, there ain't no way it's going to happen. And that's hope. But if I have hope, well, there's a chance that, that I'm going to see it. I guess maybe there's two different degrees of hope. You're about to say something. Well, what I was going to say, I'm just listening to Johnny Erickson Todd. First of all, the promise of Revelation 21, 4 says that all things are going to be made new. And when you when you listen to Johnny Erickson Tata, who's been paralyzed since she was 18 years yeah. old, mm -hmm. I don't know what her age is now. Probably in her 50s, To me, I think. hope, she, she does, uh, defines hope because she's not, she knows that, first of all, this is what we're living for. And eventually, that promise of revelation mm -hmm. is going to come true and she's going to be made all new again. Right. And then when you talk about going to heaven, can you imagine walking into heaven after you've been paralyzed since you were 18 yeah. years old? Yeah. I mean, that's hope. Yeah, That's true. And, and, and that's like I said, there is a definite expectation of fulfillment. I mean, you can't get much more than that. But like I said, there may be just, there's kind of a, a vague hope 
but maybe that's not hope. Maybe that's just wishing. You know, yeah. uh, I wish the Bears could come back and win. Well, not really, because I want Dallas to win. Uh, but normally, I, you know, uh, I wouldn't mind seeing them play each other and Dallas win. Uh, but there's a difference between wishing and hope. Well, like he was saying, uh, I, I hope that the uh, uh, Carolina Panthers, you know, come back and win. The, that's wishing. The hope is where there's actually a chance that it can happen. And in the spiritual realm, it's more than just a chance. Um, how is this hope in which he has called you different from hoping that your tem- team wins the big game? There can be an expectation of fulfillment in Christ, not necessarily in the world. Um, I'm going to skip over because we're running out of time a little bit. We haven't got through all of this yet. Um, Ephesians 1.18, where he talks about, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people or in his saints. The meaning may hinge on that little word in, I in. In Greek, the word is, well, epsilon nu, which is e n, and it has mo- it has it has a more of a, a broader meaning in Greek than it does in English. Uh, when I was learning it, n meant uh, in, on, or among. Um, and here, when it refers to the range of meaning, is greater than in English. When referring to a group of people, it can mean among, and several versions uh, translate uh, this word in as among, among uh, the inheritance among the saints. There's two ways to read this. God is granted to his holy ones, to the saints, an inheritance, and we can see those spiritual riches among us by seeing the love, joy, peace, etc. But, We can also take a second approach. God has received an inheritance in us that we are his glorious treasure. That's one reason I wanted to to study Greek a little bit more is because it it depends on the usage of the word. It depends on the nuance of how they use that word, whether it can mean in or among or on. And so you get these different translations. One of them says it means among. One of them says it means in. One of them may say it means on. But it, it doesn't make any difference whether you're talking about in or among. It all means the same, that we have this inheritance. Um, it's either really works. Uh, is there really much difference in the meaning of among or in in this particular situation? Uh a lot of times uh, the guy that was doing the class would say, you really can't tell the meaning of the word by just the word itself. It has to do with the connotation, what, what, how it fits into the sentence. And I uh, can't think of the word that he used now, but how the, the, the connotation uh, of the word is used. Uh, I'll probably think of that word here about halfway on the way home. Uh, and I'll follow up and tell you what that means. Um, but it's, uh, uh, it really doesn't make that much difference to us, whether it's among us, in us, or on us. What's the best thing that you can do for someone else to give them this kind of hope? I think to give them that kind of hope is to let them know what God has done in our lives, what he means to us, and pray. Pray. Are there times when you feel that you aren't loved by God? Do you ever feel like God forgot about me? I think we, uh, we have to remember physical, mental, and emotion feelings are not fact. Ricky, when you had your heart attack, when you was recovering, did the first thing that popped into your mind, oh, thank God you've given me this trial to overcome? No. I didn't think so. It would shock me if you'd answered that. I was, I was blessed that I was still here. That's true. But that wasn't the first thought in your mind. Mark, when you run out of air. <laughs> I was thanking 
God get me to the source. <laughs> yeah. yeah, give me some air. <laughs> yeah. I know that this stuff around me, this watery stuff around me, is uh, hydrogen and oxygen, but I don't think you're wanting me to go and take a big breath of it. I don't have any feels. There have been times when I have been so sick with the flu or whatever that it affects, it can affect you spiritually because it takes your mind off of spiritual matters because I hurt so much. Mm -hmm. I, it says here, do you think other people feel that way? Well, yeah, they're human. Hey, Donnie, when I come to, they told me I had a heart attack. And I said, no, I haven't. Yeah, I, wrong, you got the wrong person. Yeah, I remember you telling us about that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's me. That's somebody else. That wasn't me. Mark said, I'm going to tell him he had COVID. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, the day before, they had, he was negative, so. Yeah. In verse 19 and 20, and what is this, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. How does Paul describe God's power? First off, I want you to think of what is the most, the most awesome display of power that you've ever seen, whether in person or on you know, uh, uh, TV or something. What, what is some of the, uh, one of the greatest things, power that you've ever seen? Lightning. Lightning, yeah. I remember, of course, I remember back when they first tested the atomic bomb and uh, then to see the uh, destruction of, of Nagasaki um, and Hiroshima and to see that go off, I mean, see that big mushroom cloud, I mean, just that just that sticks in my mind as power. Um, you know, I think every time the power goes off, <laughs> you know, that... It's just, you really don't know what to think when it goes off because it's so dark. And, yeah. You know what I mean? And we want just a little power. Yeah. I mean, just a little light makes a big difference. In the tornado we had here a few years back. Yeah. You yeah. see them on TV all the time, but until you see them in person, yeah. the destruction is unbelievable. I uh, was out, of course, Rosie was in the basement with the dog. I was out here. <laughs> and I was out in the backyard looking around. Well, that's kind of neat. And all of a sudden, I actually heard sound like a train. I thought, I probably ought to go check on Rosie and the dog just, just to make sure they're okay. And I run downstairs and I was down there for about five minutes and I looked out the window and I thought, don't seem like anything's going on. Then I went back outside and there was things had been going on. And part of the neighbor's uh, uh, little shed that he had, a little plastic shed, most of that was in my backyard. Some of the trees was down and attacked my uh, patio table with a little glass top that was in a zillion pieces. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, even watching some of these heavyweight lifters and things like that, you know, just that raw power that they have. This one beats them all. God uses the power that raised Jesus from the dead for us who believe. He uses that awesome power for our benefit. Back in Romans 8, 11, it says, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Uh, Greer says, by invoking the power of resurrection, Paul is saying that God not only has the ability to make us into something, to make somebodies out of nobodies, he has the power to turn bad things into good things. And that good news, because for many of us, our lives are marked by mistakes and death and addictions, destructive behaviors, broken relationships, if God brought life out of death with Jesus, then he can bring life and healing back to the mess you've made of your heart and your life. Do you realize the power that is available to you? What if you really believe that God really would extend the power of the resurrection into your heart, your marriage, and your relationships? We don't need to talk about this openly, but think of the part of your life that needs God's touch of power. Our attitude, our health, struggles with temptation, our relationships. 
How could God use his resurrection power to transform that? He has the power to speak worlds into existence from nothing, to raise the dead. Surely he is big enough to handle anything that we go through. I was a big am a big Zig Ziglar fan. He's passed away. He was a uh, uh, actually he was a salesman and turned into a motivational speaker. And uh, one of the things he said that when he first became a Christian was his inability to uh, turn everything over to God. Partly it was because, well, God, I've only got X number of dollars, and I got to buy food, and I got to pay the rent, and I got, I don't have enough, got to have enough for the car payment. You know those guys down at the finance company, they're, you, you never met people like that before, God. You know, you just don't know what they're like. Uh, and he said he had trouble with that until finally he realized that, yeah, God does know them. He created them just like he created anybody else. I sometimes think that we we want to take care of the, the big things, or we want to take care of the little things and leave the big, big things to God. And if we would pay attention to God, it's all little things. There's nothing that he can do. Nothing that we can do, like I said, to make him go love us less, love us more. Um, we talked this morning in Sunday school. Nothing I can do to make him love me even less and nothing I can do to make him love me even more. Um, in Isaiah, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Um, somebody have Daniel 7? Four, four, yeah, read that one, please. <laughs> I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. I like that. It's an everlasting kingdom. It'll never be destroyed. Matthew 26, 63 and 64. But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He's at the right hand of God the Father. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, by the throne of dominion, or rulers, or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. 
God <clears throat> after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. And these last days have spoken to us in his son whom we appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. When we talked about the uh, ones in Isaiah and the ones in Daniel, those descriptions of Christ would probably lead someone to doubt that that same ruler was going to be crucified and die. And yet, and the one I really like is he is the he is the visible attribute of the invisible God. In uh, John 17, it's called the High Priestly Prayer. First off, he prayed for himself, then he prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for us. I said, my, my prayer is not for them alone, talking about the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He prayed for us. The same may be true for this prayer of Paul. He's talking about Christ as the eternal head of the church, and that includes us. So it's not too much of a stretch to hear him praying for you and me, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened with a vision of our hope in Jesus, our value to God, the power at work within us, and Christ's eternal authority. Any questions, any comments before we close? You guys make me think I'm doing really good since you don't have any questions. Uh, you explained this so well. Yeah, right. And with that, and dime, or with that, and five bucks, you can get coffee about anywhere. Uh, Ricky, know, I don't know about that either. <laughs> Pray for us, Father. We do thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. What we, when we seek it, the many things we truly find out about your life. How awesome! How mighty! How great! How blessed we are to have a God that loves us so much that he done everything for us. And that's really hard to but comprehend. So Lord, we thank you for, like I said, the word that helps us understand how truly, truly much you love us all. And Father, we thank you. And we want to give you all the glory and all the praise. Be with us all as we go our separate ways. Help us, Lord, to remember to pray for each other through this week. And those we know, Lord, who are real and who need your touch. And we'll give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 See you back in here. Some of you Tuesday night and some of you Wednesday night. Oh, I see some of you.